All right, thanks, David. Yeah, so this is uh, former postdoc work in Matt Sullivan's lab, and it's very collaborative, as you can see from this list of co-authors here. Um, interesting. Okay, so um, this is a thawing permafrost ecosystem that I'll talk to you about later today. And so these northern latitudes here shown in teal harbor permafrost. And so permafrost is defined as soil that's frozen year round for at least two years. So these regions also have high carbon enrichment in the soil. And so you can see in the darker colors in this um, map here that that about 30 to 50 percent of Earth's soil organic carbon is stored in these northern regions that are also overlapping with permafrost regions, meaning that the carbon is stored in the permafrost. And so that's all well and good. It's been frozen for hundreds to thousands of years, but uh, as we all know, climate change is, is happening and permafrost is thawing rapidly. And so that means that this thawing permafrost is providing a feast for microorganisms in these ecosystems. And I'm going to just go over a super quick rudimentary food web um, or carbon cycle in these systems. So we're starting with the first thing that can happen essentially is that these plants can now establish roots and grow. So we have more CO2 going into the system, so more carbon contributing to the soil organic matter that's already there. We have respirers and fermenters that can break down this complex organic carbon into ultimately CO2 and hydrogen. And these are some substrates, at least, that can be used for methanogenesis. And methane, of course, can also be used as a carbon source for methanotrophs. And so ultimately, what we're doing in these systems, at least to some degree, is breaking down this soil organic matter and releasing it back into the atmosphere as CO2 and methane. So these are greenhouse gases. And uh, this is a virology talk in a virology symposium, so I'm really interested in what the viruses are doing in these thawing permafrost ecosystems. So our study site is in northern Sweden. I've never been there. It's gorgeous, and maybe one day I will get to go, but um, it's uh, up, uh, up as you can see there on the map. And so here's the, the beautiful field site. It's a heterogeneous landscape to some degree. And so what we have is a permafrost thaw gradient that's a spatial gradient within this site. So we have three habitats represented in this permafrost thaw gradient. So we have our dry permafrost pulsa, so that's the most frozen of the sites, but we are sampling the active layer. And so that's the layer that you can see between the dashed line, which represents the permafrost and the surface of the soil. We have an intermediate thaw site where the permafrost has now thawed a bit, and so it's subsided. And we have a, um, a rising of the water table in those systems and differences in plant community composition. And for our final thaw site across the thaw gradient, it's fully thawed fen habitat, and we have um, essentially no permafrost, and the water table is now above the surface of the soil with, again, a change in plant community composition. And so I'm going to be talking a lot about what the viruses and virus-host interactions are looking like across this thaw gradient. So just some very basic questions, given that we uh, have limited knowledge of soil viruses overall, although there have certainly been pioneering efforts by folks in this room. Um, and we know very little in particular about viruses and thawing permafrost. So very simply, we want to know whether the viral community composition differs across this thaw gradient. We want to know what hosts the viruses infect and do any of these virus-host interactions change with thaw. And then, uh, so Matt alluded in his talk earlier to auxiliary metabolic genes, for example, the photosynthesis genes in cyanophage. And we want to know if there are any analogous types of auxiliary metabolic genes in soil. Of course, we're not expecting photosynthesis, right? It's going to be dark in there. But maybe there's something else that could contribute to carbon cycling in soil. So a quick method slide. Um, I won't go into great detail. And so those of you who are maybe particularly interested in some of the details of the methods, a few of those will appear at the bottom of these slides. But we have 201 bulk soil samples. So we've gone out and collected cores. Um, we being not me, but our many collaborators on this project. And then Gene Tyson's lab was involved in DNA extraction and sequencing and then computational metagenomic assembly. So importantly, at this stage in the process, we're looking at bulk soil metagenomes, so most of what we have here are going to be bacteria and archaea. So now we're going to apply the Veer sorter algorithm developed by Simon Rue to mine um, these metagenomes for viral sequences based on viral signature genes. We were able to recover about 2,000 complete and near-complete genomes from this system. 
and I won't go into detail about taxonomy, but we use the vContact tool to look at shared protein content with known viral sequences in RefSeq, and about 17% of the viruses could be taxonomically classified based on those approaches. So most of these, um, at least at roughly the genus level, appear to be novel. So we're interested in the ecology of these viruses as well, and so what we're going to do is figure out the relative abundances of each of the 2,000 viruses that we were able to recover across our 201 um, bulk soil samples. So we're just simply mapping the reads back from our 200 samples to the genomes. So the first comparison that we can make based on these data is principal coordinates analysis. So what you're looking at here are 200 samples, um, again across the thaw gradient, and they're labeled color-wise for the three habitats, and the proximity of the points indicates how similar viral community composition was based on those abundance matrix uh, metrics that I showed in the mapping data. So um, perhaps not surprisingly, but we were very happy to see that there is a significant difference in viral community composition with, uh, and this correlated pretty nicely with um, host community composition and soil moisture content, and those are um, known correlates with host community, well, with bacterial and archaeal community composition overall. So sort of at first glance, um, looking at the course level, it looks like perhaps the viruses are sort of just doing what the hosts are doing. But hopefully as virologists, we have a reason to look at the viruses exclusively, and so that's what I'm going to try and show you next, that once you start to look at a finer grain scale, um, there are some uh, notable differences in virus host dynamics um, that we think we can see with our data set. Okay, so starting with this, we're going to look at the host communities. Um, I'm going to build up two graphs eventually. The first one that you're seeing here is host community composition. So these are based on about 1,500 genomes that were reconstructed by Ben Woodcroft in Gene Tyson's lab. So these are bacterial and archaeal genomes grouped approximately at the class level. And so on the y-axis, that's the relative abundance of each of these host populations. And uh, on the x-axis, we have our about 200 samples separated along the thaw gradient. And so you can see pretty clearly differences with thaw for the hosts as well, particularly once you get into the fen habitat. And I won't go into detail about the methods for virus host linkage, but I worked with Simon Rue to uh, link viruses to hosts. And so we had about 35% of our viruses we were able to link to hosts. And so that's, I think, highlights the value of having both viruses and hosts recovered from the same metagenomic samples. So um, a very impressive Earth virome study by David Paez Espino, I think it was on the order of 8% of those viruses could be linked to hosts when you're considering hosts that are um, available in public databases. So it's worth considering, if you're interested in these types of problems, reconstructing the host um, genomes as well. Okay, so the viruses were predicted for about 60% of these host classes, and perhaps not surprisingly to folks in this room, we were able to recover viruses for just about every predicted metabolic process um, in this system, including methanogenesis, methanotrophy, and various um, means of carbon respiration and fermentation. Okay, so now I'm going to build the virus graph on the bottom, and what we're going to be looking at here um, is exactly the same idea, but on the y-axis is going to be the relative abundances of our um, about 2,000 viral populations, and they're going to be color-coded by their predicted hosts. So if the viruses are just doing what the hosts are doing, we should expect to see the same graph recapitulated on the bottom here. And so there are some notable differences, some similarities. Uh, before your eyes get drawn to the gray, those are just viruses for which we could not identify a host. Um, and you could probably stare at this graph all day and, and go a little bit crazy, so I'll highlight some details in a minute. But just as one example, you can see in red, the delta proteobacteria and their viruses, for example, are quite differently abundant um, in the fen habitat in particular. So that's that fully thawed site all the way on the right. So I'm going to pull apart a few specific interactions to highlight. So for each of these, um, I'm going to show you four graphs, and each of them have the host abundance that's, again, based on read mapping to host population genomes, and the viral on the um, x-axis and on the y-axis is going to be that viral abundance based on the methods that I showed you previously through read mapping. So we have uh, four examples. The first one here, you can see the acidobacteria, or one subclass uh, of the acidobacteria, has relatively constant virus host abundance ratio across the thaw gradient. So each of these points is a sample represented um, by the habitat from which it came. So the idea here is we have essentially an increase in both virus and host abundance. 
from the pasa to the bog habitat, so that's with increasing thaw, but again, just across two habitats, not necessarily across all three. We have a different um, sort of interaction here for the solobacterias group of acidobacteria, where we see an increase in host abundance from the pasta to the bog. And if we're thinking from a very virus-centric perspective, this could be indicative of an evasion of viral predation, at least better evasion of viral predation by the hosts in the bog habitat relative to the pasta. Um, of course, as all virus-centric people, we would love for that to be exactly what's going on, but these are complex systems, and so these interactions need to be definitely further interrogated in the future. For the delta proteobacteria, these are the red guys that I showed you in the previous graph. We have kind of the opposite trend, again, across two habitats with thaw, so we see an increase in the virus abundance from the bog to fen habitat, so perhaps these viruses are more successfully preying upon the delta proteobacteria with increasing thaw. Finally, it's a little bit of a more subtle interaction, but still statistically significant. For the Gematomonadides, we again see this increase in host abundance um, from along two habitats with the thaw gradient, so from the pulsa to the fen, which again is perhaps suggestive of an evasion of viral predation. And certainly, we need to interrogate these types of interactions in many more ecosystems under different conditions to know exactly what these trends mean, but I think it's very interesting that we can observe lineage-specific differences in these virus-host abundance relationships in C2. And we can also link them to changes in environmental parameters. So um, again, I won't go into detail here, but you can see that there are different parameters that are correlating with some of these virus-host interactions depending on the lineage. All right. So the last question that um, I wanted to answer here is whether or not we see any auxiliary metabolic genes in soil. Right? Um, and so what we did is we mined our genomic data through the annotation to look for any kind of host metabolic genes, and we did this in a relatively conservative way, trying to ensure that the, the genes that I'm gonna show you here were what we're calling sandwiched, both upstream and downstream in genomic context with viral hallmark genes. And so we were only able to recover, well, only um, 14 glycoside hydrolases that I'll show you here that were uh, met those conservative parameters, but there were over 300 such glycoside hydrolases in the data set, so I think it's possible that these could be um, true AMGs of some kind in soil that we should be looking for in soil data sets. Okay, so what are these guys that we recovered? So these are, um, I'm building up a very rudimentary view of the carbon degradation pathways in this ecosystem, and so the arrows are indicating the, um, the processes, or at least the cleavage points that the viruses are predicted to have on these different polymers. So these are protein structural uh, models that were done by Lindsay Solden and Kelly Wrighton's lab. So we have predicted function also consistent for these different um, glycoside hydrolases. And then so these monomers and small oligomers that the viruses are breaking down potentially then contribute to the rest of the carbon cycle in the ecosystem. So we didn't necessarily recover a strong signal of viral genes from um, any of these other processes, but the idea is that they're sort of feeding um, the, the microbial pathways that contribute to other carbon degradation in the system. So in summary, we were able to recover about 2,000 viral genomes and genome fragments, and they were mostly from unknown viral groups. We saw differences in viral community composition across the thaw gradient, and then we also observed these interesting potential lineage-specific virus host dynamics that might suggest that viral predation effects could change as permafrost continues to thaw. And then some of these viruses encoded glycoside hydrolases that might be AMGs that could contribute to complex carbon degradation in these systems. So just a quick plug for, that was my former postdoc work, and I've just started a new lab at UC Davis, um, where we're going to apply some of these approaches to study viruses in natural and agricultural soils and um, in the phylosphere. And I wanna welcome Laura Zink to the viral community. She is a brand new postdoc. She started on Monday, and I dragged her out here already. She's from like deep sea sediment microbial ecology, so this is all new to her, and welcome. Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna acknowledge some other people, real quick. <laughs> Again, this is a collaborative effort and I won't go into detail of all of these many co-authors, but I do wanna highlight uh, Matt Sullivan, my former postdoc advisor, Simon Rue, Jennifer Brum, and Ben Bolduck, who were rock stars working on the bioinformatics with me on this effort. And then, of course, Ben Woodcroft in Gene Tyson's lab, who did all of the, or, uh, all of the genomic reconstructions of the host populations. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions if there's time.